And if you know much about cybersecurity or the areas of trust and safety or technology, the names of Camille Francois and, and Shane Huntley and Google Tag, really some of the fabulous folks um, that are in this business. And so I wanted to start off with a big point, right? Learning about history and what I love about this, this hack in Google, it does such a good job of reaching back into even the prehistory of hacking. And um, hacking has been with us a long time in computer security problems. And the more that we can understand history, the more that we can understand how long we've been trying to solve these problems and that our solutions are not really helping the way that we wanted. Um, that fits in with work we're doing at Columbia SEPA to look at the history of cyber conflict. Um, I'd written the first history book of cyber conflict called A Fierce Domain. It came out 10 years ago. And one of my favorite things that came out during that process was realizing that last month we had the anniversary of the first time that it was first in print that we can find where someone had made a, a recommendation to the government that we can't just bolt security on, we have to bake it in from the beginning. We have to be security by design. And that recommendation was made 50 years ago in November. It was made in 1972 in the Anderson Report to the United States Air Force, one of the founding documents. So for 50 years, we've been looking at that. And unless we understand history, like we're gonna hear about today, then we don't understand the importance of these issues. This also fits in with another fabulous uh, Columbia SEPA program called DFRAG, which is our Hacker Film Festival. And we've done great things like um, uh, look at clips from the movie War Games and talk about it with Jen Easterly, the director of CISA. We had um, Major General Kevin Hike, who was the director of operations for NORAD and Northern Command and fa famous hackers like Matt DeVoe and Emily Coran. So being able to ask Jen Easterly, would you hire David Lightman today? Or asking the head of NORAD, is that what things are like? Like you had this depiction of war games of NORAD. Is that what it's like when you pick up the, the phone and call the president? And by the way, answers to both of those were yes. If you're interested in that war games, you can find the recording on, um, on YouTube, uh, on my Twitter. Um, it's, it's the um, pinned tweet called Jason uh, at Jason underscore here, Healy. That's Jason underscore Healy. And you can find that great um, War Games event. And with that, let me thank Veer Patap um, for helping to set this up and, turn, and the others that were uh, so important putting this together and turn it over to Camille Francois. Camille. Thanks, Jay. Um, well, I'm extraordinarily excited to welcome Shane to SIPA to discuss the history of the threat analysis group. And I was also extraordinarily excited when Google started doing this documentary series. Jay, I think, keep me honest here, but I think it's our first time having a documentary at DFRAG. And it's also the first public window into the story of TAG. So, we will share that little um, YouTube episode. It's called Hacking Google. It's the very first episode in Hacking Google. We'll share it in the chat. But I think that we're going to start with the intro clip. It's a 20 minute long episode. So we're not going to watch it together tonight, but we might just sort of like touch on little clips here and there to help contextualize our discussion. And of course, as I said, we'll share it. So, Vera, do you want to get us started with uh, the intro to what is tag? You'll see it's a uh, Google level productions is uh... commonly referred to by its acronym, TAG. The nickname is appropriate considering how TAG hunts down and well, tags malicious actors and their techniques. So security teams across all of Google and beyond can forge defenses and responses even before an attack takes place. Their smarts have helped prevent dangerous junk from popping up in your personal email and have helped keep trade secrets locked down at Fortune 500 companies. They've helped trace a mystery super virus to its perpetrators and have helped protect organizations from local canasta groups to national campaigns. TAG hasn't always had the impact that it has today, but everybody has to start somewhere. All right, Shane, um, that episode opens up on the most bizarre, although quite entertaining, scene with meerkats. And Tang is portrayed as sort of like the guard meerkat that protects the rest of the company. This might not be the most illustrative metaphor 
Can you start by telling us what is Tag, what does it do at Google, um, and then we'll start, you know, also talking about your story and how you you come to found Tag. Thanks, Camille. Great to be here. Um, I must say, like, a being featured in a, do in a documentary in this way is a sort of a surreal experience, right? So like you go in, they collect a whole bunch of footage and then all of these people that are great filmmakers and great story makers sort of like take it from there and build a story around what you said. And I think they did a great job, but it's still awfully weird to see sort of what I consider my nerdy computer job, you know, represented as meerkats or dark wizard catches or however the story tells. I think it's a very interesting documentary and it's designed for that sort of lay audience and to get the understanding. So who am I? And so I, as I sort of talk in the documentary, so I come from a government background and I was pulled into Google just after this incident called Aurora, where we can get to of like where Google was hacked by the Chinese government. And now I, you know, started this team over 12 years ago with uh, Mike Wysek, who was the founder. And then I've now I'm now the director manager of it for the last, you know, six or seven years. But really, we are the threat intelligence arm of Google. Our job is to understand these different threats, whether it is serious government-backed threats, um, serious cybercrime actors or information operations actors. And, you know, in some ways we are these meerkats, right? Like we are the ones that do keep watch. We are the ones that sort of not trying to look for the hack themselves, but really understand the adversaries. And then there is like, you know, thousands of people doing security at Google, but we're this small team that really are the experts in the bad guys and girls that are trying to do harm and sort of become that expertise allows us to do that sort of protections for not just stopping Google itself getting hacked, but for all of our users. So that's really our sort of mission and reason. And we can get more into details about like, what's that like on a day-to-day -day basis? Thanks, James, for being uh, inclusive with your language when we refer to bad actors. There are bad actors of uh, all stripes. So um, how many people are you now in TAG? And what type of people does it take to do this type of work? Yeah, so we're, as again, I said, we're a fairly small team, but we magnify our efforts. We're around about 55 people and we spread around the globe these days. Like we have people in, you know, Canada, Switzerland, US, Australia. So, you know, it's sort of the empire on which the sun never sets. And we have a range of different people. So part of like how Google does this well is that we really try and leverage our expertise in technology. So we use real engineers and do like large scale engineering, building on search, building on data processing. You know, we can process, you know, petabytes of malware, which is, you know, thousands of thousands of times bigger than like the hard drive in your computer, being able to process all the world's malware sort of like in a day and really be able to index that and sort of feed that up. But behind that sort of engineering powerhouse, we have analysts and these analysts are the sort of experts in digging into the threats. And some of them are like super experts in malware and kind of exploits like Neil Mader, who discovered the Heartbleed exploit, one of the more famous ex exploits. He's on my team and helps reverse this, this world and build systems. And then we have people who know more of the geopolitical side. We have people who are really deep in understanding phishing attacks and the whole nature of things. And then we have people who are getting really deep in information operations. So we build this range of people and tools but like we're really looking for that kind of intersection of strong technical skills but also that inquisitive spirit and the ability to sort of dig deep to find new things because this is a tough job you're like pulling the pieces together of this puzzle and trying to really understand what's going on but also having that judgment about what matters it's not about collecting every fact but it's about knowing wait a sec that's wrong this looks weird i'll dig into it and that's when people make the big discoveries of oh yeah this is some brand new attack from russia or north korea and they've discovered something something that's never been discovered before. And that's, you know, you have those great moments, but there's also a lot of hard work in between, between those great discoveries. I like this description of having sort of experts and analysts together peering over large scale technical infrastructure. And I think that's one of the things that the episode manages to represent fairly well. We can, we can have this sort of very short clip where the episode talks about the uh, internal Google systems that tag is equipped with if we're able to do that. A really great search engine software. 
To make that search engine run, Google downloads the entirety of the public-facing internet to its data centers. The good and the bad. From there, the dangerous sites and content are generally flagged before they ever reach your results page. But that doesn't mean they're useless. These bits of bad content are exactly what the tag team is looking for. The things that need to be blocked. Exploits. Software that needs to be fixed. Phishing messages. Almost every piece of malicious software that exists anywhere on the internet. We can see what they do when they run. We can like look at what's inside them. But this is something which would, for anyone else, like I don't know how they build it or it would take decades, but for us, it's sort of just lying around in the search team and we're able to use that sort of scale and technology for our mission as well. We have surprise. I think we get the, the gist of it and the idea. So um, Shane, I want to go back to the to 2010 and together, you know, I, I want us to sort of go down this 12 year history. Um, can you share a little bit about what you were doing prior to TAG? And what does it look like around Operation Aurora? What's so specific uh, and significant about this moment in cybersecurity that leads to Google deciding that it needs an in-house threat intel team, which is, again, now something that's almost routine and that we'll consider as pretty normal. Back then, not so much. Yeah, for sure. So I was, you know, before this, I came to Google, I was in like the Australian military and then sort of Australian intelligence, more working on sort of, you know, cyber areas, but not in this specific area of defense. And, you know, while I was like in the documentary, I talk about like I was sort of like on vacation at the time where I got pulled into this. Um, so I got commented, I got contacted by a friend of mine, Mike Wysak, who was, you know, I didn't know at the time. He's saying, I'm starting this new team at Google. Do you want to join me? And I said, sure, that's great. I'm, I'd be really keen. But then it was like a couple of days later that I actually saw this big blog post from Google, which said, and the blog post was called A New Approach to China. And this blog post blew my mind, right? Because there was a couple of things about it. One is in early 2010, this is when Google actually came out about Operation Aurora and actually said that they had suffered this like what looks like a nation state attack from china and also that they were taking fairly serious action in terms of changing their policies towards china as a result and we also said at the time or that google i wasn't there said that like i think it was like 20 other companies were also affected so this is like for, the, for those of you, many of you are much younger than me, this sounds really boring at the time. And now, these days, it's almost standard. But at that time, nobody was talking about this stuff, right? Like, companies were getting hacked all the time. They were talking hush-hush to FBI or someone else out. But no one was willing to really say out loud that it was China, all these things happened. It was all being swept under the rug. And notice that, like, none of the other 20 companies at the time were willing to actually go on the record with us. Um so even like the acronym we use today of advanced persistent threat back in the day was really invented so people wouldn't say China out loud because they're a little bit scared of saying China. So one, I went, wow, like somebody has finally gone public on this and kindly bringing this into the public conversation. And I think this was a very key event in terms of like somebody having this level of transparency and doing this. Uh, but my, again, my second thought at the time is, okay, now I know why Mike hit me, why Mike contacted me three days ago to form this team and I'm interested in what it is. So about two months later, I actually had like packed up my house and moved to California and joined this brand new team. And they were just finishing operation, the whole Operation Aurora response. Like Google really had pulled out everything. They had pulled in anybody who was required, the most senior people at the company. They had, you know, reworked their network. But at the same time, they'd also built this team to really work out who the attacker was. They'd used all the power they had, all the understanding they had, the best engineering, their understanding of like forensics to really work out behind it. And then we can, and then they did a great job. They worked out a lot of who was behind the Aurora attackers. And that's why they were so able to go forward and be public on this. But in the end, what they decided was like, you know what? These threats aren't going away. 
we need to prevent the next Aurora attack and we need to be ready for the next attack along those lines. We need to permanently have people to understand these threats. And that is what Threat Analysis Group was founded to do. But when I rocked up, it was like the day after Aurora. I was walking into the just deserted operations center of which had, you know, last week it contained 100 people and now contained the five of us in tag. I think there was like three people in another team. So this whole Google building with eight people and we were starting relatively from scratch it was like okay let's try and build a public threat team without much knowledge about it and let's start from there and you know i think today i'd say we have one of the world's greatest threat teams but on day one we were still working out how to do this we had a lot of assets and a lot of smart and some smart people but you know it took us a while to find our feet when you say world's greatest threat team that's an objective analytical assessment right <laughs> So I mean, you could probably build some metrics out there, yeah. but it's, uh, I, I'd, say um, we're, I'd say we're up there. I think what's what's fascinating in that history of SAG, and again, it shows in the episode, is you really start focused on China for the reasons that you said, and focused on protecting Google. Google just got hacked. The corporation's willing to say that publicly. That's very new. So it's focused on one threat actor. It's focused on state actor. It's focused on protecting Google. And then you're going to evolve towards tracking many actors and many types of actors and this sort of slow evolution from protecting the corporation to protecting Google users. We're going to talk about like when you make that pivot. And in that episode, you talk about what the fact that what keeps you engaged at your job is that today you also end up protecting a lot of important democratic systems. Um, and it's fascinating to see this evolution again, like from a focus that's quite uh, narrow on China, on the corporation, to this focus on let's not just protect Google's users, but also key democratic systems from a wide variety of threats. In that episode, you talk about showing up at Google and saying, all right, I have to protect the corporation from a bunch of nation states. You have five pieces of malware. You know about one threat group. Where do you go from there? How do you go from Aurora to every everything else? What does this sort of journey look like? I think the part of it was just natural evolution. As we sort of like went hunting things out, we actually just discovered more and more and take it where it goes. And I think that's generally where we are, right? Like our understanding is when we run across something about a threat actor, we want to fully understand it. And then we want to continue that understanding and that tracking and maintain that picture. So, you know, what became very clear is the like, you know, Google doesn't get hacked that often, right? It's not as if we had a whole bunch of Aurora incidents. So we were looking into everything else we can to like look at these threat actors as preparation. And, you know, it started bubbling up that we started seeing that stuff coming towards our users that we're able to see and, you know, different escalations of like high profile users being targeted by phishing campaigns. And these weren't just people trying to like, sell supplements or normal sort of financial scam stuff that seemed very targeted. And as we dug more into that and got that level of understanding in, you know, 2011, it became very clear that there was fairly broad scale activity, again, by China in this case. We wrote a blog post in June 2011, like locating it to Jinan, China, that this was this sort of campaign that came against our users as well. And that was became more and more of a focus. And today, that's by far our biggest focus. And part of it's just numbers, right? Like we have billions of uh, users across all of the in multiple products, actually. And but only a, a finite amount of Google and our Google defense teams are great. But End users don't have Google defense engineers, right? So like we end up actually being the level, the layer of defense for these users who are really relying on our services. And that becomes a much more important thing for us. Um, because we are at Columbia Defrag, uh, I've been given permission to nerd out on very specific details of that history. And Shane, since you are talking about the June 2011 blog post, let's sort of double click here. I shared it in the chat. Um, on that blog post, you're saying it's interesting because when you join uh, Google, when you create that team in 2010, while Google at this stage is, is willing to say publicly it's been hacked, it's not exactly saying like, and we're hiring Shane, and there's tag, and look at this, we're doing threat intel, right? It, it You start a little bit under the radar, and it's when you pivot to saying we're also going to protect Google's users that you kind of have to start being more public, right? So is, is it right to say that June 2000 
11 is your first tagged blog post where we start hearing the tag voice talking about these threats? Was that the first? Yeah, I think I think it is. And it was actually a big deal at the time. And it's sort of interesting, this evolution of the like working out how sensitive things were and working out where those lines are. Like we didn't know at the time as like we were sort of pathfinding here as like were these were these countries going to come after us? Like, how was it going to be perceived? Were we going to face pushback from, like, governments, including potentially the American government, for, all, like, talking about this sort of stuff? So we really were cautious in some ways while sort of, like, pushing forward. So we're sort of working it out. And what sort of is the norms now? Like, back then it was, like, a really big deal, war room, many, many approvals all the way up to the top of the com com company to get that blog post out. And now it's not quite that way, but now it's a pretty standard process of, the, oh, yeah, Tag's doing another blog post about North Korea. And it's sort of like, yeah, we're trying to get two out this month. And it's sort of like just part of our standard thing. So I think that's how it's sort of evolved over the time. And in that blog post, there are seeds from things that you started back then, which I think you were the first ones to pioneer for the industry that you continued. One, one of my favorite lines is, you write, that Google has notified the victims. And in that blog post in June 2011, you talk about, again, where the attacks are originating. You name the types of victims. And again, like here, we're going to see types of victims that are coming up again and again in the history of TAG. You talk about senior US government officials, political activists based in China, uh, officials in, sev in several Asian countries. You talk about military personnel, and you talk about journalists. And so quite upfront, quite early in the history of TAG, we kind of see this concepts of vulnerable users, users that are on the receiving end of these sophisticated campaigns. Talk to us about my favorite feature on the internet, the state-sponsored warning. What is it and why did you decide to do this? Um, yeah. Sure. So I think one of the most interesting questions and important questions we always have about what we do is the what do you do with the information once you find it right so we sort of saw this as the okay we know these users were targeted and what do we do with it obviously we can do some protections of sort of like undoing the damage and resetting their passwords and doing protections we can build the protections for next time which is super important but like what is our sort of you know, moral obligation or decision about what we do. And it's, I'd say this is like one of the hardest parts of my job is dealing with users um, and dealing with the sort of range of users. Because one, they vary a lot, right? So like sometimes the targets will vary everywhere from, you know, somebody who is a cabinet secretary or working in the White House all the way down to a, you know, teenage activist in Iran being targeted by the Iranian government. And so the messaging between, you know, the, those sort of extremes is fairly high. Um, so what I came up with this idea, and I, I still sometimes regret it, is that we sort of put this big red warning to everybody that we see that's a target, including even if we didn't, they weren't successful, we put this warning and we want to tell users they're a target, mainly not because we want to take a specific action, but we want them to understand that they need to be careful next time and we give them some options about how it could do. We will kind of want it to be a little bit of a wake-up call. Um, and I'll be honest, right, it has a lot of good effects. Um, it also has a lot of downside too, right? Like it's a really hard message to get clear, right? People, you get a message and everybody trying to communicate that you've been targeted but you weren't hacked but be careful next time people freak out they want to do stuff they feel there's something to do like getting the right response out of user communications is hard like i track threats i i know malware i know kernel exploits and all of that stuff is really easy compared to user communications like i'm much more confident on one than the other shane when uh, when people receive that what are the types of things that they want to hear more of or that they get confused about i think the I think a lot of people want to know who and why, and which, which is reasonable. I think it is very, I think drawing the line between targeted and 
compromised, I think, is a subtle point, which is difficult to communicate, but we do a pretty good job. And then there's a lot of point of, like, what do I have to do? And then we try and provide some, you know, stronger guidance these days on, like, the actions that somebody can take and what level of protections. And I think that's one of the other big goals here, right, is that, like, we never want to be in the position of telling people there's nothing you can do. Like, there's this impression that, like, if you're targeted by a government attack, then there's nothing you can do. And, like, there's some people who are terrible about this. But in reality, most government attacks are actually pretty terrible. Like, the numbers that are zero days, we see a small number of those, but most of them, they're not magic because they're the government. So there's things you can do, there's protections you can take, there are ways that you can step up, and there's ways that we can protect as well. So I don't believe in all of this is lost, and part of this is our communication with those people. So if, if anybody on the call has ever seen this red interstitial, sometimes people think it's a joke or something that Google does to keep you on your toes. It's not. If you have received it, please take it seriously. And you can consult one of the resources that Shane and his team have put into place, which is called the Advanced Protection Program. And I will share that link in the chat. But, but Shane, let's talk just a little bit more about like these warnings. You say people want, want to know more, and that seems legitimate, right? If, if I'm receiving a message from Google saying, I've been targeted by a state-sponsored um, actor. Why can't we tell them more about who it was? I remember when that program first got rolled out, it was um, a coalition of civil society activists and NGOs who said, wow, this is great, but we absolutely want to know more. Give us more transparency into this threat. What was this conversation at the time? And sort of talk to us about the limits of what can be shared with the target when you do target engagement. I think one of the, the the big challenge with anything along these lines is always the how much information are you giving the attackers? Um, so, you know, if you give the full details and make it that you immediately tell somebody something, then the attackers can test against it. They can see what we know. They can find out everything there. So that's why we sort of batch them up and we only give the warnings out every couple of weeks. Um, and also why we don't do too many details. Like some of the worst, I would not say worst, but some of the most concerning behavior actually comes from the civil society people who want to use these warnings in order to dig into all the malware. And, you know, especially when we sent it to the spam folder, we're not sending people these warnings so they can dig it out of the spam folder and accidentally click on it. So people misunderstand the warning. It's, it's not about allowing them to dig into the past. It's about allowing to protect the future. And I think we'll be evolving these warnings in the future. Like, I think we'll be doing less warnings for places where we totally blocked it outright and nothing got through. I think we need to tone down our warnings and you'll probably see that in the new year because like we are worried that we are we never want to be in a position of causing more confusion and more concern or causing people to do the wrong thing such as dig into stuff too much you know our primary purpose is the how do we protect you against the yeah, next that's attack. really interesting last question on the warning in 2019 you started publishing a map of where those users who got warned were based you did that again in 2020 on two blog posts i love these maps so really interesting transparency exercise it's like this is where the folks who got targeted reside in both of these maps it's also very clear that the us is the top destination for the recipients of the state-sponsored warning why do you think that is is that just a byproduct of the threat actor groups that you most track um how how do you explain that i, I think there's a couple of factors at play here right so one is one is as the us is a big country with a lot of users they're also like relatively you know the other major population countries generally are not as strong it don't do not have as many google users right like google is not nearly as big in china for instance even india but yeah there is a lot of targeting of the us right the us is such a major power and is involved in so much there is so much you know targets for spies to go after whether it's industrial espionage whether it's whether it's um you know international security whether it's anything else there is like the us has a good proportion of the world's targets so therefore we see a lot of the world's threat actors go after them and do you want to give us a sense of volume for sort of where you started and like the first batch you sent in june 2011 and sort of the regular batches that you send these days like is this an exponential growth like give us a sense of, of what we're talking about in terms of volume yeah, it's actually like it's it's grown a bit, right? If I recall correctly, I think we started around like the ten thousand a year mark, but it's only really grown up to the forty thousand a year mark t today. So we see boosts, we see the numbers go up and down. I'm a little wary of like drawing too much conclusion into the overall numbers. Like they can, 
easily be like shifted just by like one actor doing one really bad campaign like we saw a campaign i think last year from like one of the russian groups they just decided to like spam out a phishing message to like twelve thousand users in one day and we blocked every single one of those messages but we sent out a lot of warnings because of that but none of them actually got through so overall numbers but i'd say there's been a slow growth in terms of overall attacks in this space but it's not the what changes more day to day is who's being targeted versus how many totally are being targeted. Right. Um, last sort of two things again on that June two thousand eleven blog post that is the first voice of tech that that announces so much of the 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 history that's going to follow. You say two things. The first one is very early on, you credit the external researchers who have provided the lead for the operations you expose. So you do that at that time for this China-based operation, and this is something that TAG has continued to do throughout the years. Talk to us a little bit about your relationship with external researchers, how it has evolved, and who are the group that you work with most closely? What do they bring to you um, that, that you don't have uh, at Google with all the telemetry and talent that you have in house. Yeah, I suppose the like, you know, I think all of this kind of countering threats is a team sport. Like we all have our, we all bring different strengths to the table, different visibility to the table. So we work very closely with the other big companies. So we work closely with Microsoft and Twitter and Facebook, and you we can like work with our kind of counterparts there. We also, you know, talk to governments where it's where it's appropriate and we can sort of like share against common threats. And we also work with like security research and security vendors. Um, what's really useful to us a lot of the time is the like, we have a huge haystack or whatever, but the sort of like knowing where those needles are is hard. Um, I think we're also really good at pulling on threads and finding out the whole details of things, but often what can be really valuable from external leaders to start. So like an example is the like, we're not like, we may not see everything going on or work out what's important, but I can think of a couple of cases, like in one case, uh, you know, a Iranian civil society group actually had a couple of people targeted. It was reported to them and they were able to tell us about one or two users here and there, but then we were able to work that out of like, Oh, actually this is tens of thousands or even a hundred thousand users that was targeted by this sort of like man in the middle attack because we we're able to pull the whole piece together so i think that's what's always been incredibly valuable for us is these starting positions of where to look because that's one of the harder problems and i think you get that from actually engaging with the target population and there are people who have really good relationships with the people being targeted and filtering that up to us has been incredibly valued throughout our life Citizen Lab comes up as a group that's often cited as a partner of your research and that helps eliminate the types of threats that civil society, for instance, is on the receiving end of. The other thing that I was going to ask you about is very early on, you also talk about uh, notifying relevant government authorities. And you just mentioned working with governments that can get pretty complicated as a tech company. And I'm sure that in a 12 year tenure, you've seen the ups and down of that relationship Talk to us a little bit about what it's like to be a threat intel team in Silicon Valley and what those relationships with the government can look like in the good and in the bad days. Yeah, I think, you know, I think anybody working in this space has to work out what their principles are and how they work with government, how they work with everyone else. So we have very strong principles around privacy, around user data. It's also very much upheld by law, right? So we have very strict requirements on how we handle data what we can look at i certainly don't have visibility of everything that goes on on google platforms we can you know use systems and very sort of private ways to sort of like see some things primarily from public data um but we i think we what we work out is like what we're going to do with it once we discover something and like some things it's obvious that the right place is to notify the authorities right so you know we see that you know if something is a crime then there's processes to report crimes and then we'll we report that to law enforcement in that way there are some times where you know we will see an organization targeted or the u.s government or the french government or the australian government or some other government and we're able to tell them about something and provide notification because of what we've seen so we build that sort of relationship but we always build it in a way that 
you know, we aren't an arm of the government. We are independent. My job is to defend Google and our users. And, you know, there's places where with anybody externally where we have common interests and there's places where we don't, we don't have common interests. And we always try and maintain our independence. Like, you know, I used to work in a government. I don't anymore. I chose to work actually to defend Google instead. And that's what I see my job is. And that can get pretty tricky. For instance, in November 2021, the MIT Tech Review wrote an article saying that Google, in its security efforts, had exposed a campaign that was actually a campaign allegedly used by Western intelligence organization in the context of a counterterrorism operation. Do you think through or what are the principles that govern the types of operations that you decide to disclose and to disrupt do you go through sort of an internal set of questions on is there more benefits than harm and risk in exposing such an operation? Or are you operating from the principle that if some of the uh, hallmarks of the cybersecurity issues are there, you're going to expose? Um, and final one on this one, how do you think about notifying uh, when, when, that, when that happens? Okay. So yeah, this, these are these are complicated issues, and but it's in some ways it's also a simple issue as well, right? The the case in question was not, um, and you know I don't actually even know all the full details, and I can't confirm exactly who was behind these operation that was mentioned. So I'll, I'll tell you how it looked from our point of view: is that like what we discovered was a zero day exploit being used relatively indiscriminately in the wild. And a zero-day exploit is one where there is not a patch available that anybody can be hacked by it. And we basically found this lying around the internet, and it was vulnerabilities in commonly used software. Um, I think some of it actually was Google software and Chrome, that these were basically weaknesses found in commonly used software. And what we did is we got we fixed those weaknesses. And I think that's what we always do. That's our principle. If we discover our software or anybody else's software is insecure, then especially if it's being actively used in the wild, our job is to fix that as quickly as possible. And I think I 100% like have no regrets on us ever doing that. So I understand that governments have like, you know, a offensive cybersecurity role and their job is to try and work out how to break into things. But I think... I've never really run across anybody that disagrees that like if you're using Chrome or Meet like we are now or anyone else that Google should ever leave a gaping hole in our software that we know about it just to let the spies operate that if we're able to discover this stuff on the internet we actually able to discover that the stuff that needs to be fixed it's our job to fix this stuff and that's what we did here and it's really that simple that you know our job is to make things more secure um and you know, people like NSA and others can you know continue to try and do their efforts, but it's not up to us to make insecure software to make their life easier. Our job is to you know build a secure world for everyone. And it's not just Google products. Some of the zero days that you expose, publish, and patch are also in other people's product. Right, your last blog post here actually talks about a campaign uh, that was exposed by North Korea and vulnerabilities in Microsoft products. How do you work with the rest of your peers in the industry to, to give them time to, to patch and respond and to sort of do this team sport that you're talking about in Hunting Zero Days? So yeah, this is something along with Project Zero, one of our sort of sister teams that we've pushed forward is terms of the like, we want to push forward the industry. like. You know, 10 years ago, there'd be an exploit used in the wild and Microsoft or someone else might take like months to patch it. And really users can't wait that long. So what we do is we um, we give you seven days. We actually give, if we see like something actively being hacked on the internet, we actually say you've got seven days to patch, otherwise we're going to go public about it. And what we found is that, like, when we first did this, there was a lot of complaints. Uh, Microsoft complained in their blogs, and Apple complained, and everyone else. And there was a whole bunch of, like, conflict about this. But I'll tell you how it looks today with, like, recent blog posts on both Apple and Chrome and with Microsoft is now they just go, 
oh yeah, Tag or Project Zero has found another exploit. I guess we're going to have to work a bit this weekend and we patch it and it just happens. So it turns out we can do this when we try. So now when we discover something in the wild, people will be patched and fixed within seven days. That's because of the incentives. And I think you don't understand security until you understand incentives. Really, you don't understand anything about human behavior until you understand incentives. I like the stories of things that were very odd the first time and are now sort of bizarrely normalized. All right, let's take two last stops on that history and then we'll open it up a bit for question. The first stop is the 2016 election, the election that took the cybersecurity word, um, you know, caught them flat footed a bit. Uh, what did it look like for your team? Um, there's, of course, a huge hack and leaks component, which is enormously uh, important for Gmail. What did it feel to be tagged on the other side of everything that happened in 2016 and 17 from the you know, Russian interference in the US election to the Macron leaks? What was that moment for your team and what did you learn? Yeah, it, it was it was a surreal experience, to be honest, right? So, like, we'd been tracking these threat actors, and, like, one of them is, like, Russian military intelligence, like, often known as APT-28. And, like, we were constantly working to, like, block their ability to fish people, and we were seeing that day in, day out. But then, you know, we had this moment where we saw this site called dcleaks.com, and it was sort of like this, you know, like site showing the leaks of mailboxes and whatever and from different places and then we were able to see it going wow this is actually done by russian military intelligence and like normally we were really used to seeing people do things for espionage but this was one of the first cases where we really saw this sort of like hacking and cyber attacks then being used to sort of like run these campaigns and some of these got a lot of traction right so like some of this hack and leak stuff made it into the presidential debates and like it was super and it was being denied at the time by you know one of the candidates and by many people that like no this isn't the russians it's someone else um but you know we were pretty clear it was the russians so it really was weird seeing you know this security crossing over into a presidential election um and i think on the sort of you know information operations side as well and more of that came to light afterwards like you know really learning that you know and countering those efforts about how foreign actors really were trying to push messaging and pretend to be users and create fake accounts and you know as the kind of big response and wake up call from that and follow on efforts you know i now have a full-time sub team that deals with tracking information operations threat actors of like Prigozhin and the iranians and dragon bridge out of china of the you know we track these now actors doing information operations in the same way we track the ones doing hacking so the idea is to like make it boring, right? <laughs> in in 2020, in May 2020, you start publishing a bulletin, right? a quarterly bulletin, where you're just gonna say, "Hey, these are all the I/O that we found over the last quarter. Uh, here you are. Here are the number of accounts that we disrupted, and something that you know sounds like it was very new and very surprising in 2016-17 is now part of the routine <laughs> routine work attack." I think that's generally true, right? Like one, we, we published that for transparency that I, I do think this problem is massively overstated. Like I sort of joke sometimes that there's this thing at the moment where everybody who thinks everybody they disagree with on the internet is a, like a Russian troll, like, or as a Russian, or as some information operations. So really there's just a lot of people on the internet that look like Russian trolls or believe really weird things. They're not necessarily IO operations that IO, they are just normal people or at least people. Um, we have, but I suppose the other side of it is like, I think you always get to this point, right? None of these problems are actually solvable. It's all about the equilibrium. So and I think if you didn't have teams like TAG and our investment, we would have so much more hacking. We'd have so much, like there'd be a lot worse, but just because you do have it, we're never going to stop all of it. Like my goal is to make this stuff harder. We want to make it 
more scary to use zero days on the internet because we're going to get them patched. We want to make have the people be really cautious with their phishing campaigns because otherwise they get caught and blocked really quickly. We want people to have to put a lot of effort into their malware. And we also want to make it so you can't just do massive IO campaigns on YouTube or anywhere else that if basically if you pop up and get a couple of views, we're immediately going to take action. So we're never going to eliminate it, but I think we can massively reduce it. But it is this sort of cat and mouse game or kind of like uh, from Alice in Wonderland, the Red Queen, of the you have to run really, really fast just to stay still because, like, you know, if we ever took our eye off on the ball, the attackers would run with it. So it's that constant catch-up, which is good for my job security, but also <laughs> sort of good for interesting. And it's also we want to make this interesting, right? By, by killing all the old attacks, we make the attackers need to come up with new ones, and it makes our job interesting that we're not just looking at the same stuff. And it sounds like it's not just the same attackers, right? So you're telling us in 2010, you show up, there's one group, and then we sort of see all those different state actors. You talked, of course, about like going from China to North Korea to being very focused on what Russians are doing. But today, talk to us about how many threat actor groups you track and more importantly about the subtypes, right? Like you started looking into cybercrime actors in 2020 and now you're looking into commercial spyware. Talk to, talk to us about how you organize your deck of cards of bad actors that you're tracking these days. Oh, you're on mute. See, team, this also happens to Google people. I hope this makes everybody feel yeah, good. Yeah, because the, um, um, the threat, like, I'll stick to the government side for the moment because, like, the cybercrime is just its own massive world. But, like, I think we have, like, 270 groups in our database, right? And, like, at the top, you've got, like, the big, fairly famous Russia and Chinese ones. At the bottom one, like, you might have, like, literally two guys in a police station in Mongolia which are sending out some phishing messages, right? So I think the last decade has really seen that if you want to do some form of espionage, the best way to do it is on the internet because anything worth knowing about is somewhere on the internet. So everybody builds these capabilities and it's not that hard. So we have so many nations and groups all getting into the game. One of the more concerning factors and something, you know, along with Citizen Lab, I you know testified in front of the Congress earlier this year is on these commercial surveillance vendors. Not only in even, it's not that hard to build a hacking capability, but if you don't want to now, there are, you know, companies in Europe and Israel and other places which will happily sell to the most repressive regimes to allow them to, you know, hack democracy activists or dissidents or journalists. They always claim it's for terrorism, but it ends up consistently being used to attack civil society. So in my team, we sort of split up of like different parts of the world. We have a whole sub team that's really looking at this hack for hire and commercial surveillance vendors sort of area. But like, this is a worrying trend that, you know, we aren't just tracking the top actors anymore, but like there is real harm being done, especially in the sort of civil society world by, you know, smaller nations and, you know, smaller nations enabled by bigger nations. It's really interesting that you're now sort of publishing about these companies in the same way that in the past you published about like big state sponsored uh, actors. In November, you released a post about a Barcelona-based company uh, called Veriston. And when you do deep dives like this on specific vendors, do you reach out to them? Do you do you say like, hey, you know, we're <laughs> we're exposing you, we're going to disable you, and we're gonna we're gonna publish about you? How do you navigate the fact that here you're you're dealing with with businesses, right? And that I suppose sometimes can even be your your users and your customers. Yeah, I suppose I from from my perspective, I, I kind of see threat actors as threat actors, that if they are coming after us or coming after of our users, then they are our adversary. And generally, we don't give our adversaries a heads up and we don't give the adversaries a chance. So, like, if we're pretty clear, as we are in some of these cases, about the nature of the activity, like, we don't really have any qualms about exposing it. It's helpful. Thanks, Shane. Uh, we still have a few minutes to open it up to questions from uh, everybody in the room. And as we do this, please feel free to raise a, a virtual hand or to share a question in the chat if you would rather uh, I, I share the question uh, myself. Um, but Shane, as we, as we collect questions, I want to thank you again so much for taking us so patiently through 12, year, 12 years of very colorful 
tracking of different bad actors across different types of threats and targeting different types of users. So um, everybody in the room, any additional questions for Shane on the colorful history of TAG? Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Always good to somewhat reminisce. Everyone here that I work with has heard all my stories before, so it's always good to have a fresh audience. But um, it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey, so glad to share some of it with you. We have uh, two raised and Oliver, you want to go first? Three raised ends. And you can also type the questions in the chat. Oliver, you can unmute and share your question. Perfect. Uh, so firstly, thank you. Thank you both so much for such an interesting discussion. I really appreciate the time. Um, I wanted to ask about um, any shifts that you've seen in the tactics, techniques, and, um, and procedures, especially of Russian and Chinese threat actors since 2016, when kind of, you know, the, the lid, the, 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 hood, the hood was opened and it was the you know the fact that there were these kind of camp these information campaigns where it was much more public now and so that with that exposure at force i would imagine that forces a change in the way they do things in order to remain effective and i was just curious on uh, any observations you've had in the change in those tactics sure so so one i'd say i'm not 100 percent. i'm not really convinced that they have been that effective to be honest right like i think information operations can be overblown a little bit we have seen that they have shifted like their opsec was really bad in 2016 like like basically attackers only use as much opsec or operational security as they need and back then you didn't need much now that we're on to them they have to work a lot slower and a lot harder so i think you'll see a lot of cutouts you'll see a lot of sort of them being much more smaller scope we're also seeing a blurring of the lines of the like information operations in is isn't as clear a line as it's either hacking or it's not generally in information operations you have this everything from they are totally pretending to be somebody else and being run by a nation state then all the way through the they're just being shady about they're doing then the state media and there's all the then it's like a pr firm there's all these things that are borderline so i'd say it varies a lot in terms of io and it's probably one of my more messiest areas i want to elevate one of uh, jay's question taking a uh, host and moderator's privilege jay is coming in with a very tough question <laughs> maybe even a bit of a yeah. trolley question, the unknown unknown one. What is the percentage of total adversary operations that we think the cybersecurity community as a whole has visibility into? You know, this is always the question we've had since the start, right? And I think one of the ways we measure it is that how often we're surprised. In the first couple of years of TAG, every time somebody surfaced something, it would be new to us and going, wow, we didn't know about that. These days, it's actually really rare when it comes to something on Google that is coming in from an outside source that's not something we know about, that we don't already know about. It may be a variation of something. So I think we're seeing a reasonable proportion of attacks in some places. I do think there's a smaller number there. There's definitely attacks that aren't being exposed and especially high end and very specific and targeted ones. But I think of especially out of the stuff that gets a bit more broader, I think there's a pretty good chance that you get caught at some point with the number of threat intel teams, the number of detections, the totally, totally staying under the radar forever is incredibly hard. So I think we're doing all right, but I still think there will be big surprises that turn up. Hey, are they adversaries that you think are understudied or underexposed or types of threats or specific victim focus that you think are a little bit you know, less exposed than what they deserve to be? I think, and I think some an area that we do a lot in because of where we are in terms of like some of the civil society targeting is like some of the stuff that happens within countries, I think can be really understudied, right? So there's not, there's a lot of people looking at say Russia stuff coming to the US. I think the many of the attacks going for say Chinese government to some of their own citizens or even smaller places of the what happens in say a southeast asian country or some of these smaller more oppressive regimes going against their own citizens like the gmail accounts like some of that is really studied by no one and the, i think there's, there's no fancy group names or you know kind of you know element names or fancy pandas or bears or anything for those there is all it's kind of just happening behind the radar and i think that's the bit that's understudied that's really interesting 
Um, I want to give Lena the last uh, question. Uh, oh, I think we also have a hand from Dawson. So let's talk. The, let's take these last two questions uh, before we wrap. Yep. Hi, thank you so much. Um, it's been really informative, and I really enjoy like, all the content you share. One of my question was that since the cyber uh, landscape has changed so much, I was wondering how has the approach to recruiting cyber talent has changed over the years. Um, you were at Google, kind of like how you have been, like how the standards for kind of like the roles has changed. Yeah, I think a few things have changed now, like in a few different ways. Like when we were starting, there was nobody who was like a professional in this. So we were really pulling people who sort of like for general skills. Now there sort of is a like cyber threat intelligence sort of pathway, there's certifications, there's like degrees, and there's a lot of people bouncing around uh, that have like go from this job and turn it into a career. I think that, you know, some of that's good that you can pull in skills, but I also think there's risks to this as well, that it, like we can be a very closed community. So I'm always still trying to look how to bring in new people um, and how to bring in new backgrounds. And I think that's super important because I do feel some threat teams only, they, they're all ex-military people like me or all ex-government people, and they only hire their buddies who are all, you know, the, look very similar to them. So that's why we try to be global. We try to hire good people. And honestly, my best hires in many cases haven't been people that have been doing this forever, but have been super motivated people who are earlier in their careers, but just have like a really strong technical background. They understand it, but also a lot of enthusiasm, ability to dig into problems. And then because of so much what we do is unique anyway, we provide the training and we get, we build them up from there. Shane, that is such a great message to hear here at SIBA, where we have a very global interdisciplinary community of sharp and curious minds. So I hope everybody heard that and sees this as an encouragement to bring new backgrounds and new perspectives into the field. Dawson, you get the last question. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, hi, Shane and Camille. Uh, just, once again, thank you for the presentation. Thank you to everyone who set this up. Um, I just really like the insight into how TagUp works um, and all the blog links too. I appreciate it. Um, but I suppose it's really relevant to what you just said. Um, but as a student graduating this year, that's really interesting, like malware analysis versus engineering, and is <laughs> currently working on a take-home final for my malware class. Um, does TAG specifically have like internship or new graduate like positions um, specifically to the program? And I guess as a more open-ended question, has Google's recent acquisition of Mandiant affected like the resources that you have access to um, with TAG at all? Yeah, so Mandiant, for those who don't know, is like a major cybersecurity company. And again, one of the do a lot of threat intel work as well. So they're primarily focused on Google Cloud um, and kind of external customers. We're working more closely with them and trying to work out how to work more closely with them. So I think you'll see more partnerships and more sort of joint research coming out of from us in the future. Um, generally hiring sort of stuff like you know it's, it's it's a tough hiring market at present to be honest like i think there's a lot of pullback in resources in terms of who has headcount to hire i think there still will be opportunities there still is internships at different places generally what we find in tag is we're generally not people's first job we hire relatively early career people but often we have people that go into some other area and build up some sort of experience in sort of like in sort of SOC or some somewhere else a little bit to get a bit of breadth before they're doing full-time tag stuff. But it can really vary. So we do advertise positions every so often, but, you know, there's, there's different paths here. Um, and, you know, malware is, and there's also many other different roles and ideas for like malware analysis is a super interesting topic. It's one part of what we do. It's not the only thing, but it's, uh, it's still a key part. We haven't solved the malware problem yet. All right, team, we're at time. Shane, we know that uh, these conversations are rare and that it's a real privilege for us to be able to sit with you for an hour and unpack a uh, tag of where it's coming from, what it's doing, what it's focused on and what it's seeing. So a huge thank you on behalf of everybody at SIPA, students and faculty and researchers and our friends. I saw a few people joining us from outside SIPA for having this conversation with us. We're really grateful for it and we hope to hear more uh, about the work that Tag's doing. Now we all know which blog post to read. We're all going to closely track what you're tracking. Cool. Yeah, read our blog post, follow me on Twitter, and uh, it's been great to be here and uh, talk to you today.